like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, I'm speaking today, which is uh, the Wongal people, um, and pay respects to their um, elders, past, present, and, and emerging. So um, Andrew was kind enough to invite me to, to speak about um, something which is, I'm really quite uh, interested in and, and uh, is part of my really part of my work that uh, has been for a long time uh, in terms of being interested in, in studying environmental science and back in, in my university days it was all about the greenhouse effect and, and certainly now being mindful about um, how the climate is changing and, and what impact that might have on, on mosquito-borne disease. And you know, I've been working in this field for about 20 years now, and, and I'm interested primarily in trying to uh, keep the um, Australian community safe from mosquito bites and, and mosquito-borne disease. And so any future change in that is something which I'm, I'm very, very mindful of. So it might come as, as some surprise to you to learn that there are actually about 300 different types of mosquito in Australia. And so we might just think about that one mosquito that's buzzing around our, our summer barbecue. Um, but natural fact, Australia has an incredibly diverse range of mosquitoes uh, and they're found in a wide range of ecological niches. And that's one of the reasons why um, it's a very complex um, question to answer when we're thinking about how mosquitoes will, will change in response to a, a changing climate. Um, internationally, there's probably about 3000 mosquitoes um, that are currently known to exist. But to be honest, there are many species, a lot of insects that are probably yet to be formally described. And, and even as we get a more advanced, um, uh, you know, scientific methods of investigation, we're realizing that even some of the mosquitoes that we can't tell apart when we look underneath the microscope actually have subtle differences in their biology and ecology, which all may play a role in, in the ability of them to transmit um, uh, the pathogens that cause mosquito-borne disease. So Australia already has uh, a few mosquito-borne pathogens that cause a lot of disease. Um, we'll talk about malaria and dengue in a moment, but here in Australia, the most common mosquito-borne disease is Ross River virus. Um, it causes about 5,000 cases of disease right across the country every year. Uh, fortunately, it's not fatal, but it can be a really severely debilitating illness with fever, uh, joint pain, um, and, and particularly, um, you know, there's a bit of rash as well. But for some people, you have mild flu-like symptoms, but for others, you can be almost bedridden for many weeks or months. It can be a severely, severely debilitating illness. And we're, we're seeing that really edging into the fringes of our major metropolitan areas too. So. Um, this, disease, this, this disease is primarily a concern of rural and regional areas, um, but more and more in recent years, we're seeing it on the outskirts of Sydney, uh, as well as other major metropolitan areas like Brisbane, Melbourne, um, Perth, and, and, and even in recent years uh, in Tasmania. There's a suite of other mosquito-borne pathogens that are a concern in Australia. Um, Barmer forest virus that you may have heard about. Uh, we get a, a few hundred cases every year about that. But we've also got some potentially quite significant illnesses um, caused by some pathogens. And so in Australia, uh, Murray Valley encephalitis virus is probably the most significant. It's one of the few viruses spread by mosquitoes in Australia that can actually kill you. And there's been some major outbreaks in the 1950s and the 1970s uh, that caused significant impact to, to human health in Australia. The outbreak in inland areas of New South Wales, Victoria and South East of Southwestern Queensland in the 1970s really prompted, um, you know, a lot more study in the mosquitoes in Australia and was really the genesis for some of the mosquito surveillance programs that we have uh, around the country. So we've already got a lot of mosquito-borne disease to worry about, um, and that is quite wide-ranging um, across Australia. Um, and but certainly with the changing climate, we're concerned about some of what we might refer to as tropical. Uh, disease as well and I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment but I think it's important to talk a little bit about uh, mosquito biology because uh, this is something that really is critical to understanding how mosquitoes will respond to changes in temperature and rainfall and humidity and sea level rise into the future and what that might mean for future mosquito-borne disease risk. So mosquitoes are pretty complex uh, animals in a way and what's quite interesting about them is that they have both um, an aquatic phase and also uh, a terrestrial phase. So we're familiar with mosquitoes buzzing about and flying about and trying to bite us. 
it's always important to remember that irrespective of where you find mosquitoes or how different they are, they all have this aquatic stage which requires them to lay their eggs in or on water. Um, and those eggs hatch and the mosquitoes go through a number of growth stages in the aquatic, uh, in, in the water before they can emerge as, as an adult. And this development in, during summer might only take about a week, but the water where mosquitoes lay their eggs can be incredibly variable. It can be from the wetland type environments or a water holding container in your backyard, your rainwater tank or your roof gutters. And mosquitoes really have a, a very specific um, association with the, where this water lies and, and where they breed. And so for each of these species, there's different types of habitats that are associated with. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. The other thing about their biology, which is really important, is their blood feeding behavior. So mosquitoes aren't like a flying dirty syringe that transfers infected droplets of blood from person to person. The mosquito actually has to feed on an infected animal or a person. It has to take in the virus with that blood meal, and then it has to become infected itself before it can pass it on uh, to people. So what's really uh, important to know about the different types of mosquitoes that we find in Australia or overseas is that some mosquitoes are really effective at transmitting certain types of pathogens that others aren't. And so to understand the risk of the transmission of something like dengue virus or the malaria parasites, it really relies on specific types of mosquitoes to be present, uh, not just mosquitoes generally. And so there are all these things are things that we think about when we're um, considering what the risks of mosquito-borne disease may be. Some of the things I'm interested in as uh, really an environmental scientist and an ecologist is the interaction between that's insects, and animals, and the environment. And mosquitoes are a great uh, animal to study in that regard. So as I said before, we've got about 300 species of mosquito in Australia, and all of them have this very close association with particular types of habitats. So for some mosquitoes, they love the salty coastal wetlands, salt marsh and mangrove type environments. They just love um, the forests, the woodland, the bushland areas, breeding in these ground pools that result after a bit of rain. Then we've got mosquitoes that are breeding in what you consider to be the typical type of mosquito habitat, these freshwater wetlands. Um, and and they kind of a, can take a lot of different forms as well, because as well as these pristine wetlands that you might imagine, these types of habitats can also be represented in stormwater drains and um, uh, flooded irrigation areas of agriculture like that as well. And then we've got a whole suite of mosquito species that really love uh, living in the, in the habitats that humans create. And so water holding containers around the home like uh, pot plant sources, bird baths, block, roof guttering or rainwater tanks. And so all of these mosquitoes, not only are they found in particular types of habitats, but each of these <coughs> mosquitoes bring with them a different level of capacity to transmit uh, some of these mosquito-borne diseases. So when I'm worried about what the risk of mosquito borne disease might be in one part of the country, I have to think about not just the type of habitats that are there and what the climate is, but also the suite of different mosquito species that may be involved in transmitting these pathogens. And so the question um, that we're sort of talking about today, I guess, is that you know, how will a changing climate increase this risk of mosquito borne disease? And so it I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that if we're living in a, in a warmer world, that's warmer temperatures are better for mosquitoes. When it's wetter, it's good for mosquitoes. It creates uh, increased abundance of mosquitoes, but it's much more complicated than that. And I think what I would like to share with you today is about some of these other aspects of mosquito biology and ecology and how that might influence uh, what the future risks of um, mosquito-borne disease are. And in many respects, I wonder about um, not just about uh, how the climate is changing, but how human activity and habitation is changing and what that risk might be and what that might bring for um, the future of mosquito-borne disease. So mosquitoes are generally considered the most dangerous animals on the planet. And one of the reasons for that is that they kill anywhere up to a million people every year. But um, it's not the mosquitoes themselves that are killing people, it's the pathogens they can transmit. And so for parasites like malaria, that cause malaria, um, there are uh, currently over a half million people that die every year because of malaria, but there's hundreds of millions of cases of uh, disease. And that's primarily the burden is felt in um, many developing parts of the world, um, Africa and Asia into the Pacific. 
Um, Australia, we were declared free of malaria in the 1980s, um, but there's still a risk, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But really, one of the most important mosquito-borne diseases in recent years is really dengue. Um, Dengue is um, a disease that's caused by a suite of four different viruses spread by a couple of different key species. And the burden of disease because of dengue has been incredible in recent years. There's hundreds of millions of cases of disease. Um, the impact on uh, South America and Asia into the Pacific is quite significant. And really in terms of the future and some of the more serious mosquito-borne pathogens we're concerned about in Australia, in many senses, dengue is, posed, is, is a far greater risk uh, than malaria. But it's not just in the future, it's really interesting to think about what used to happen in Australia. And so even if you were to go back and look at some of the newspapers in New South Wales back in the 1920s and 1940s, we weren't talking about uh, Ross River virus, we we're talking about malaria and dengue. And it's come to us quite some surprise for a lot of people to realise that we actually had cases of malaria in Sydney, uh, locally acquired case of malaria on the northern beaches and in Western Sydney around Auburn. Um, and that was primarily due to returned servicemen and women coming back from, from World War I. But even dengue, the mosquitoes that transmit the virus that causes dengue were quite, uh, were present almost right throughout New South Wales. And the southernmost um, confirmed case of dengue was actually on the central coast. And so, um, this is kind of really poses a really interesting question for us because we think to the future and the spread of, of tropical mosquito-borne diseases, but in actual fact, historically, they were already in Sydney and parts of New South Wales. And so as much, when it comes to predicting what ha is happening in the future, um, much, much of it has to do with understanding uh, what has happened in the past, uh, as well as how the climate might be changing in the future. As I said before, dengue is really um, the disease that we're most concerned about. And one of the reasons why dengue has uh, impacted uh, communities um, around the world so significantly is, unlike something like malaria, which is primarily a disease of rural and regional areas, dengue is really a disease of the cities. And some major um, urban areas of the world see significant outbreaks of dengue. Uh, particularly in South America and, and in Southeast Asia in particular. So, you know, you're not immune to these outbreaks of disease, even though you're living in a, uh, a high-rise apartment in an incredibly dense city. And, and I think that this dengue is really a, a, a disease that, um, you know, typifies what the future may hold for mosquito-borne disease, because what drives these outbreaks is not just climate, it's, it's human activity. And that human activity here in Australia could be uh, prone to the spread and, and um, uh, um, an introduction of this risk again in the future. Before we talk a bit more about that, though, I guess it's worth mentioning that there are also a suite of other mosquito-borne pathogens that can go at different times of the year in different parts of the world. And, and, and as someone who studies mosquito-borne disease, I'm always interested in seeing these new, this news articles in recent years where you're seeing the, the, the emergence of and you know, mosquito-borne disease in a new part of the world or, or a disease in a part of the world where we haven't seen this disease for maybe decades. And um, a great example about that is, is Zika virus. And so you may remember the emergence of Zika virus in, in 2016. Um, and it was also, um, you know, threatened to close the, the 2016 Olympics. It was so significant, the impact of disease in, um, in South America. And it's a great example of, of a virus that we know we knew about it for, for decades and decades. We knew that mosquitoes could transmit it, but we thought it was really responsible for very mild illness. And its emergence in an area of the world that had never seen it before, huge numbers of people were infected and we started to see these more uh, severe cases of illness resulting from, from infection. And when we've got, um, you know, there are hundreds um, of, oh, there's, there's sort of tens or dozens of uh, mosquito-borne viruses that we know about. We don't think that they pose very significant mosquito-borne disease, but perhaps in the future, uh, the emergence in a different part of the world or a different part of the country may bring much more significant consequences. So again, it's not just about um, how the known pathogens change in the future, it's about some of these pathogens that we don't really think are a threat, uh, maybe more, more of one in the future. So the thing that makes dengue and Zika and some of these other um, diseases such a concern is that there is couple of mosquitoes involved in spreading these viruses that love living in human habitation. 
That's uh, the Asian tiger mosquito and the yellow fever mosquito. So that's Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. And what's unique about these mosquitoes is that at one stage they used to live in uh, water-filled tree holes and water holding axles of plants, but now they've given up those habitats and they live in uh, mostly artificial water holding containers around the home. Everything from bird baths, pot plant sources, bottles, tins, uh, just discarded rubbish, rainwater tanks in particular are a great habitat for them. And so these mosquitoes love living in human, close to human habitation. They love biting people as well. And so when you add great habits around um, our cities with mosquitoes that love to bite people, mosquitoes that are great at transmitting these viruses, that brings a, a risk of, of some of these pathogens like dengue. So the yellow fever mosquito, Aedes aegypti, is really the most important um, mosquito internationally for the spread of dengue. And Historically, up until about the 1950s, it was quite well established in Sydney. Uh, the, there were reports of the mosquito. And as I said before, there were no one cases of locally acquired dengue um, in Gosford. But after the 1950s, we saw a, a quite sudden and, and dramatic change in the distribution of this mosquito to the point where uh, for a long time, it was only ever found in central and far north Queensland. And what's important about that is that while Aedes aegypti is a really effective white mosquito in terms of its ability to transmit dengue virus, none of the other mosquitoes in Sydney or New South Wales at the moment can actually spread it. And so that means that the risk of dengue is only where this mosquito is. And its distribution from uh, New South Wales into central and far north Queensland has been debated. We're not really sure why that happened. It could have been a whole range of reasons. Um, everything from um, the shift away from rainwater tanks to um, reticulated in the more widespread use and availability of insecticides around the home. Some people have suggested that um, the, the widespread use of the lawnmower meant that we kept our lawns uh, clean and tidy and it removed some of the habitat from mosquitoes. Maybe it was the, um, a lot of the returned servicemen and women from World War II who went into the field of environmental health and were mindful about the mosquito risks and more, were more trained to eradicate them. And even the suggestion has been that um, steam trains, the, the shift from steam trains to these on inevitably an electric motor played a role as well because the steam train network facilitated the movement of mosquitoes because uh, all the trains had water holding containers on them, all the all the stations had rainwater uh, water tanks and things that facilitated their movement around around the country. And this is one of the issues that is often uh, raised today is that, you know, this retreat of the mosquitoes had nothing to do with climate, something else was playing a role. And maybe if we're sort of providing more habitat for mosquitoes, such as the proliferation of rainwater tanks, you know, in uh, predisposing our cities like Sydney for the reintroduction of this mosquito. And the mosquitoes just don't come, it's not just the mosquito threat that's coming back into New South Wales from, uh, from Queensland, where we work closely with the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources to monitor mosquitoes at our airports. And in the last sort of five to six years, we've seen a steady arrival of mosquitoes at Sydney airport and major airports around the country. And these are mosquitoes coming in from uh, other parts of the world with people and their belongings, uh, particularly the movement of freight. And so, for instance, the mosquito, such as the Asian tiger mosquito, we're probably not gonna see that mosquito naturally arrive in Australia, no matter how warm the country becomes. But what we're going to see them arriving in is with people and their belongings and, and movement of aircraft. It's the movement of people around the world that facilitates the movement of these mosquitoes, which is probably more critical. And importantly, again, I mean, obviously the current situation, global travel has ground to a halt, but up until uh, 2020, huge numbers of people were moving around the world and you could move from one part of the world um, and carry the virus. And so it's important to remember that, uh, particularly in the case of dengue and many of the cases um, that we see in Australia, it's return travellers that are bringing the virus back. Um, in far north Queensland, where the yellow fever mosquito is, those travellers would have an outbreak of disease locally uh, around Cairns and Townsville. Um, but this international travel, I'm sure that eventually, I guess we hope, many people will hope we'll get back to sort of somewhat normal situations, but it's the movement of people that move the virus around the world um, more so than um, mosquitoes. And so locally, um, 
the risk is not so much about um, the exotic pathogens like dengue and malaria coming in, but an extension of the season of mosquitoes and, and more cases of some of our homegrown viruses. And, and one of those is Murray Valley encephalitis virus. And so, um, you know, we're particularly concerned about that, not just because of warming temperatures, but particularly increase, increasingly frequent, um, significant uh, extreme weather events. And we saw those around 2011, 2012. We had major rainfall in, in inland areas of New South Wales and southeast Queensland. And as a medical entomologist, what was really interesting is after the flooding that resulted from this, a lot of farmers were being interviewed. You hear a lot of these interviews where they talk about, um, haven't seen flooding like this since the 1970s. And this, of course, for a medical entomologist, just brought to mind um, the risk of something like Murray Valley encephalitis virus. And while we avoided any um, outbreaks in 2011 and 2012, this is always going to be a concern when we see major outbreaks um, associated, or major flooding events in inland areas of, of New South Wales. Because not only does that provide an increase in mosquito population, but it also provides an increase in the birds which bring the virus. And so for these mosquitoes, like many mosquito-borne diseases in, in Australia, a mosquito doesn't hatch out of the wetlands carrying the virus. It has to bite an animal first. And in the case of Murray Valley encephalitis virus, it's going to occur. For virus, which I spend a lot of my time um, concerned about, uh, the animals that the mosquito picks up Ross River virus from are kangaroos and wallabies. And so what that means is that when we're trying to assess the risks of mosquito-borne disease, I have to think about the wetlands, the mosquitoes, but also the wildlife. And what's really interesting is that we're seeing um, uh, activity of Ross River virus in many parts of the outskirts of Sydney. And those outbreaks are occurring almost exclusively where you have either kangaroos or wallabies. And in Sydney, that's particularly swamp wallabies where we're seeing their um, you know, uh, return into many bushland areas of Western Sydney, the northern suburbs and the southern suburbs of Sydney, where authorities are doing a great job of controlling foxes and other feral predators. That's great for the wallabies. The wallabies bring an elevated risk of Ross River virus. But also what I'm interested in is where people are living and we're living close, closer to some of these wetland areas. So while this primarily applies to some of the work I do in, in coastal areas of northern New South Wales, we're also seeing this in Sydney. There's more and more people living uh, right up against these wetland areas, these bushland areas. And not only does that pose a risk of uh, disturbance to the environment and increasing pollution levels, it also can potentially increase the risk of mosquito-borne disease where you're having people, mosquitoes, and urban wildlife um, in together in local locations. Similarly, we're trying to do a good job of recycling and conserving water in, the, in our cities as well. We have to be mindful that there is a risk of mosquito-borne disease too. And so constructed wetlands are a common part of urban developments throughout Sydney, not just in Western Sydney, where I do a lot of my work, but also in the cities themselves. So we're trying to green our cities uh, through water recycling, green roofs, installation of rainwater tanks. But we have to be mindful that the, this green infrastructure uh, brings with it a risk of increased mosquito populations. In many cases, we're building mosquito habitats where those habitats didn't previously exist. So the work I do, um, we use um, mosquito traps. We do surveillance of mosquito populations. I thought you might be interested in this type of mosquito trap that we use. It's a pretty basic um, design, but it's used internationally for surveillance of mosquito populations. And basically, it's a billy can full of dry ice. The carbon dioxide that's released from that dry ice attracts mosquitoes. Mosquitoes think this is a, a cow or a person or a kangaroo. Um, and they're very effective at collecting the mosquitoes we're interested in. They're mosquitoes that are looking for a blood meal. And female mosquitoes, they're the only ones that bite. They're attracted to a warm-blooded animal because of the carbon dioxide primarily that's um, exhaled. And these are great traps to do that. And we have networks of traps throughout Sydney and also New South Wales that monitor changes in local mosquito populations. And so we're able to use some of this information to sort of see how mosquito populations are changing um, over time. And so I guess the next question that comes from that is that if mosquitoes are posing a risk, so in the future, if we're seeing an extension of the mosquito season, we're seeing more uh, Ross River virus in, in autumn or in the early in spring, um, or we do perhaps see some of these exotic mosquitoes arrive in, in Sydney, you know, what are we going to do about it? And it's interesting that, you know, the eradication of mosquitoes has been on the mind of people for hundreds of years, really. Um, and even here in Sydney, um, this is an article from the... Um, uh, from 1929, from the 
from this morning Herald where there was a lobby group from Western Sydney trying to get authorities to um, spray kerosene over the Parramatta River to control mosquitoes. And, and that's something that we have to be mindful of. How do we manage mosquitoes without opposing a threat to the local environment? Um, mosquito control in Australia has come a long way. Um, you know, it was only decades ago, really, that we were draining wetlands, we were using petroleum products on our wetlands, we were using insecticides like DDT and organophosphates to try to control mosquito populations. But in the last decade or so, mosquito control around the world, but particularly in Australia, has shifted to more ecologically sustainable products. So uh, this is a shot from a mosquito control program we coordinate in Sydney Olympic Park in Western Sydney. We use a bacterial-based product that's applied to the water that actually kills those uh, aquatic immature stages of the mosquitoes. It's incredibly uh, specific to mosquitoes. And um, in the decade or so we've been running this program, there's been no uh, noticeable or recorded non-target impacts. It's not impacting people, birds, the rest of the environment. Even studies have shown that some of the other insects, um, because of their slightly different feeding mechanism, aren't exposed to the toxin that the mosquito larvae are. But there's still concerns about um, how we go about doing this type of mosquito control. And just mosquito control itself is, um, you know, open to debate what the um, unintended consequences of that would be. You know, what's the ecological impact of knocking out all of these mosquitoes that might be food for birds and bats and fish and frogs? And this led a lot of research internationally to uh, the development of genetically modified mosquitoes. And so while um, that's not something that we're seeing in Australia at the moment, in areas that are prone to significant outbreaks of dengue, uh, the release of genetically modified mosquitoes or mosquitoes that have been reared in the laboratory uh, that are carrying um, a pathogen or a parasite that actually blocks its ability to transmit dengue virus or perhaps maybe to kill mosquitoes uh, or to stop them breeding, for instance. There's a whole suite of technologies now that are being um, investigated. But what's really interesting is, that, um, you know, in much the same way that we see debate around, um, you know, vaccinations and, and other public health interventions, uh, there's a lot of uh, community um, consultation that's required before we go about the release of genetically modified mosquitoes. And, and how much, however much potential it holds, there's certainly a risk, and, and certainly the risk um, um, that must be minimised through, through consultation with local communities. So I guess to finish up, what does all this sort of mean for New South Wales? So I think there's no doubt we're going to see a future of, of uh, a future activity of mosquito-borne pathogens around Sydney. There's no doubt about that. And I think that um, as our weather warms with, with climate change, I think we'll start to see more mosquitoes active uh, during spring and into autumn, um, much longer a season than what we would ordinarily expect to see. And perhaps in combination with some of these other efforts that we're doing around our, um, our cities to kind of create water bodies, to create refuge for wildlife, um, unfortunately, that might also see some more case of Ross River virus. Some of the tropical diseases we may be not likely to see. Maybe we won't ever see things like dengue or chikungunya or Zika virus. The limiting um, the outbreaks of those patients probably has more to do with quarantine, detecting exotic mosquitoes that come into our cities, and our health authorities being well prepared to respond to those to try to eradicate. So I guess that's brought me to the end of that presentation. I hope that's been uh, a good overview of, of mosquito risk in New South Wales and what might be posed by um, a changing climate. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our CCL channel by hitting the button in the top left hand corner of this screen. Spread the word of CCL by using the share icon to as many of your contacts as possible. Thank you. See you next video.